Welcome to the Wednesday night Bible class at the Dover Church of Christ. Tonight we'll be talking about the atonement, the reconciling work of Jesus Christ, and how to present this information to somebody else. All right, everybody, we are in part two of the gospel, the power of God unto salvation. And tonight we are narrowing down our field of view from just a, a very broad definition of the gospel, and we want to look at some of the particulars a little more closely. And so tonight we're going to talk about the atonement. The atonement. Atonement is an idea that runs throughout the Bible. We find atonement in that word in explicit terms, most concentrated in the Law of Moses, when you're dealing with uh, the Day of Atonement, sacrifices made by the priests, that's, that's where we find it in explicit terms the most. We find it less so in the New Testament, although the idea is very much there. It's very prevalent in the New Testament. The word atonement is a, a theological term. It's not one that we use a lot in our daily language, but it's not a term that should scare us. It shouldn't scare us. We can really simplify the term very simply uh, by looking at it like this. Atonement at one mint. Two things made at one. At one mint. That's the, the core idea of what atonement is. At one mint. And that's really what I want to focus on, not so much the theological deep stuff that isn't going to benefit us so much with a one-on-one -on -one study. We're not going to look at the terms too much, but we want to look at the concepts, because the concept of atonement is something that we need to be able to understand and then give to somebody else. Does that make sense? All right. Atonement deals with the reconciliation of two parties that are estranged for one reason or another. The reconciliation of two estranged parties. Now, before we get too far into this night, this evening's study on the atonement, we need to mention a few things. God was not obligated to give us the option of atonement with himself. Was he? God was under no such obligation to provide the means of atonement between us and him. He would be perfectly just to leave us in that estranged relationship between us and him. He'd be perfectly just to do that. And in doing so, he would be perfectly just to just allow us to stay in our sin for eternity. So, the fact that God has done anything for us at all, tells us of his great love for sinful men, and it tells us of his tremendous grace given to sinners. And it has to be grace. Because if God was under compulsion to give us that atonement, it wouldn't be grace. It'd be a, an obligation. And we've said God is not obligated to do any such thing for anybody, but he has. Secondly, we need to talk about the way God provides atonement. We know that God provided atonement through the death of Jesus on the cross. And we need to know that that's the only way that it could have been done. Why, though? Why is the death of Jesus on the cross the only way that God could bring reconciliation between God and men? It's a tough point. It's a tough question. But let's put it this way. If there had been another way that it could have been done, wouldn't Jesus having to come into the world and die for sins have been completely unnecessary and cruel? The fact that it had to be done that way tells us there is no other way. Do we follow? I think it also, again, it reflects back on the seriousness of sin. Yes, it does. It, it reflects on the seriousness of sin. Randy? The word atonement is often used, it's translated 
reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a math term. It has to do with like we reconcile our checkbook. Mm -hmm. my, my oldest sister had to reconcile the books for my her husband, who was an insurance salesman. One time she stayed up for five in the morning trying to reconcile one penny. I said, go to bed and give him a penny. <laughs> and she said, I can't. You, it has to reconcile. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I realized that later, when I went to college and studied and realized that's the concept behind this. Yep. There, you know, death, I mean, sin demands death. Payment has to be made. Yep, it's a, it's a debt. And the book has to be reconciled. That's right. And so we can't do it, only God can. That's right. That's a good point. Only God can do it. Yes, part. Um, what about the blood? What does the, where does that come in? Is that the biggest part of it? Everything seems to be about the blood. We're going, the animals? We're going to get into that okay. in a little bit. <laughs> but that's a great question. So just keep it in mind in case I don't address it to your liking. So, question, question. Yes, sir. You, with what you said, for some reason I went back to Noah. Okay. All right. And, you know, we know how that story turned out. Was there, God decided not to reconcile those people? Or did he, he gave them a chance with Noah's preaching? Who, everybody that perished? Yeah. Well, ultimately, everybody has the decision of whether or not they're going to hear the preaching and obey it and find reconciliation. Um, but they... they Apparently they rejected. They had the opportunity, but they yeah. That's that's what I'd say. They only gave them 120 years. Yeah, you had 120 years to figure it out. <laughs> Clearly, they they didn't want to take that offer. But you can understand their doubt too. It had never rained. They did. God was loony built the boat on dry land. You know. Yeah, I suppose from one perspective it would look that way. But so let's get back to this for just a moment. Since it's the only way it could have been done is through the death of Jesus. What does that also tell us about other religious systems and other faiths? By necessity, they can't be another way if Jesus is the only way. Right? So, just a couple of things to preface the, the class. And so tonight, what I want to discuss is what atonement is. We're going to define it, define our terms. It's always important. We want to discuss why atonement is necessary, the purpose, the nature of it, how it's received, how it's applied. I want to illustrate the point. I want to give us a, a usable illustration tonight, something that we can teach to somebody else, something very practical. And then I want to get into some more practical stuff. We're getting to that point in the class now where we can do this. How are we going to use this information? And I have voluntold Mr. Mike to help me out with that part. So, voluntold. We're going to see how that goes. So, before, before we get into it, I want to ask you this. Where is the first place in the Bible we start to see this, this image or this concept of God providing atonement, a covering for men, for mankind? Was it before Abraham? Before Abraham. Was it before Abraham? <laughs> it was. Yeah. Cain and Abel, sacrifices. Before that. Yeah. They were naked. They were naked. <laughs> Randy's on to it. Genesis chapter 3, verse 7 and verse 21. You'll have to turn there. You probably remember the story where they were just having finished their meal of whatever that fruit was. Their eyes were opened, and they were naked and ashamed. And you remember what they did? Hid themselves. They hid themselves, and they they made clothes. What kind of clothes? Leaves. 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 They made leaves for themselves to try and cover up their, their shame and their guilt. Because they knew they couldn't stand before a holy God the way they were. God says, no, what you've done for yourself isn't going to cut it. So what did God do? Verse 21, what did he do? He made for them 
garments of skin. He made for them a covering that was suitable, that allowed them to be able to stand before God without guilt and shame. That's Genesis 3, 7, and 21. Where do you suppose that skin came from? Skin doesn't come off of a, a plant, does it? Something had to die to make that covering that allowed them to stand before God. I believe that's our first real glimpse of this idea of, of atonement that we find in Scripture. I think that's really cool. I hope you do too. So, why is atonement necessary? Why is atonement necessary? We can come up with all kinds of reasons, can't we? We've sinned. We can't stand before God because we sinned. So atonement needs to take place. But there's a couple other aspects of this that I want to look at. Reasons why atonement is necessary is because of, number one, who God is. Who God is. God is the holy law giver. And you, you can apply that word holy to both God himself and to his law. He is the holy law giver. And atonement is necessary not only because of who God is, but because of who we are. And who are we? We're sinners. We're sinners. We are, we'll say, unholy lawbreakers apart from what God has done for us. That's, that is our position. God is the holy lawbreaker. We are the unholy, or God is the holy lawgiver. Ooh, I need to repent. God is the holy lawgiver, and we are the unholy lawbreakers. God is holy. He's altogether different. He is to be treated with absolute reverence because of his holiness. He is the sovereign creator of the universe. He determines how the universe functions and how the people within it function. He, he does that through his laws, natural laws, moral laws. And God is also just. God's perfect justice demands that he perfectly executes perfect justice. He, ex he always executes the right judgment on sin. So that's who God is in a, a very condensed way of saying it. And now we turn our attention to us, mankind, who we are. We have not treated God as holy. We haven't treated him with the reverence that he deserves. We disregard his sovereignty and his rule by breaking his laws. And so what's the result of that? We've broken the laws of the sovereign, holy ruler of the universe. We are cosmic treasonists. <laughs> it's cosmic treason. I, I like that term. I don't remember where I heard that from, but I like that one. And so atonement is what God has done by providing mankind what it desperately needs. Because they have broken his laws. And a really awesome scripture to tell who God is or about him is uh, Psalm 148. I was reading that this morning and I, wow, this yeah. is just awesome. Give it a read, folks. <laughs> Give it a read, Psalm 148. Any comments or questions before we move on from there? Okay, that's the that's the bad news, right? Where we are raising a, a hand of rebellion against a holy God. It's not a good situation to be in. It's terrible. God wasn't obligated to do anything to fix the situation. But he did. He did something. But if you're studying with someone and they would they say, Well, I've always been a good person. We're going to get there. That's part of Mike's job for later on. You just you don't know what's going on yet, but you will, so it's okay. So that's the reason, one of, well, some of the reasons why atonement is necessary, who God is and who we are. The next thing we need to discuss is the fact that atonement always has a cost. That reconciliation between us and God, we're estranged from God because of our sin. 
And to, to bring reconciliation, there is always a cost. Always. Now in the Old Testament, how was atonement made? Animal sacrifices. And in some cases, even with money. There were some things where you could just pay a sum and, and that was your, your fee to make atonement. But generally, the one we, we think of is there was an animal sacrifice, there was the shedding of blood to make atonement for sin. Is that where the Catholics got their idea for to pay for sins? Or perhaps, I don't know. No, they needed to build the basilica so they yeah. needed to do something. <laughs> oh. That's probably it. That's probably it. But there's a, I should have written this down, it just, just occurred to me, but uh, I think it's in Genesis 6 or 7 after Noah gets off the, off the boat and it talks about life is in the blood. Yeah. yeah, life is in the blood. Blood has to be spilt because life is in the blood. So, there's always a cost in the Old Testament. We see it through the, the sacrificial system, sometimes paying with money, but there's always a cost to somebody in one way or another. We also know that the blood of bulls and goats Cannot do what? Save. save. Can't save you. Can't For, forgive sins. You can't take away the sin problem. Mm -hmm. Hebrews. Yep. Blood, bull, blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. Well, one reason for why they can't is because they don't properly represent the one who committed the sin. Do they? Well, maybe for some of us, we're a bit more like a. A, a dog or an ape or something. We may behave like animals. But, <laughs> but animals are not a perfect representative for those who have sinned. So that poses a little bit of a problem. Someone from Adam, from the line of Adam, had to take on that sin debt to be the right sin sacrifice. When an infraction occurs, the offending party is responsible for making things right. Adam, Adam is the offending party. We are sons and daughters of Adam. We have the responsibility to make things right with the one we have offended. Right? The offended party has the option to give grace to the one who caused the offense or what? Enforce the penalties for the offense. Are you going to press charges? You may have may have been asked. You have the you have the, the right to say I'm going to let this go, or you have the option to press charges against somebody who causes an offense against you. Either way, somebody is still absorbing the cost, aren't they? So I want to use an illustration, and this is something I, I want you to listen carefully to. And it's something that you can use to describe what Jesus has done, what God has done for us who have caused an offense against God. So let's say you go over to somebody's house after church Sunday. You go to, your, to their house, you're supposed to have lunch together, it's going to be a great time. But you go through the door, you lose your footing, and you bump into their favorite lamp. And this is a beautiful lamp. It's one of a kind. It's a priceless family heirloom. It's irreplaceable. But you broke it. You broke that lamp. What are you going to do? It's priceless. It's irreplaceable. It's one of a kind. You have no way of fixing it. You have no way of paying for it. What, what are you going to do in that situation? Grovel. Grovel, right? <laughs> We're going to grovel. <laughs> That's about all you, you probably could do in that situation. But you broke it. You have, an you have an obligation to pay for it, but you can't. So now it's up to the homeowner, the owner of the lamp, to make a decision. Are they going to let you off the hook, or are they going to hold you responsible? You see the connection? We're, we're in a, a very similar situation with God apart from what God has done for us. I kind of lived my whole life under that. I was dusting and I broke 
my mother's dish, the only gift she had from her daddy, who died oh. when she was 10. <laughs> and it just, it just tore me up. Mm -hmm. And I didn't do it on purpose, you know, it's an accident. I didn't mean to bring that up, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but that's hard. It is. It's hard when you offend someone and you cannot make it up. Yeah. You just can't fix it. You can't fix it. And you, you, you feel this illustration on a personal oh, yeah. level, so it, I, I'm sorry that happened to you. That's, that's, sorry she made me dust. That's her fault, right? That's her fault. <coughs> but the homeowner can either let you off the hook or hold you responsible. We, we sing a song to that effect, don't we? we? He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. That's the, the concept we're looking at. So remember that, that house illustration, breaking somebody's lamp. That's the situation people are in when their sins haven't been dealt with. So in our case, as Christians, we haven't had to take on that debt. We haven't had to absorb the cost of, of that lamp being broken, so to speak. That cost still goes somewhere. The homeowner of the universe has absorbed that cost for us. With God, God the Son absorbed the cost of our sin debt. That debt was not excused. It wasn't swept under the rug. It wasn't not dealt with. It was dealt with, and it was paid in full. Amen? That's... That is great news. That debt was paid in full. That's the idea of this atonement. Why it's so exciting. Why I hope we can, we can just really latch into it. That debt was paid in full. So we don't have to bear the burden of it anymore. Don't we have a tendency to try and keep paying it even though it's already been paid? Yeah, guilty. That's me. That's, it's hard to accept that kind of forgiveness. It is. I, I read something in the last year. There's a man in England who checked a book out of the library. And uh, when it came to take it back, it had, he had set it somewhere and something had knocked over on it mm -hmm. and damaged the cover. Now, it, the, he got the stuff off of it, but the cover was definitely, had a, not scar, what do you call it? Just, you can see oil in the, in the binding. Yeah. So he took it back to the library and showed it to her. She said, you'll have to pay for the book. He said, okay. So they brought the head librarian up. She determined the price of the book and charged him. She turned around and put the book on the shelf. He said, just a minute, I bought that book. I want it back. So she didn't like it, but she gave him the book. It wasn't that easy to find another copy. Mm -hmm. He started going, she says, you can't go out because it's still got the mark of that library on it. She went to peel it off, part of the covering went with it. He said, are you damaging my book? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> he turned the tables right around right off. I want to tell it, say this. We're always on the indebted part. God's never indebted to us. Mm -hmm. You know, it's easy that's for us to want to be forgiving because we need to be forgiven. You know, mm -hmm. I teased Jeanette the other day, called her a name. Uh-oh, this I, is on film, you know. Yeah, Careful. I, I called her <laughs> a relative's name. And, and she, watch your attitude, dude. You need me right now. <laughs> uh, well, you know, mm -hmm. you give and take because we're all guilty. We all do wrong. Mm -hmm. But God never does. He's always on that receiving end of the, of the guilt. Yeah. Our guilt is against him. That's a good point. I, I don't think we can understand fully because we are human, frail, mistake people uh, how God can be so perfect. No mistakes ever. That doesn't right. compute in our minds. It <laughs> is hard to... It is just... It is so flabbergasting. That there is, yeah. that's the God we serve, and it's so awesome. Oh. Yes, indeed. 
So our debt was paid in full. Uh, we need to mention this as well. There is no atonement. There's no reconciliation. There's no putting away of sin without the cross. That was the method that that debt was paid. That's, that's the, uh, the credit card, so to speak. I don't want to refer to it like that, but hopefully you get my point. Because it's at the cross that God's justice was upheld. God's justice was upheld, sin was paid for, and then the path of grace to be received by us was provided. That's where all that, that great exchange took place, was on the cross. Without the cross, we're left to pay a sin debt that we have no way of paying. Uh, Matthew 26, 39, Jesus prayed, If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. If there was another way to make atonement without the cross, uh, this verse tells us that there wasn't. There was no other way. Let this cup pass for me, if it be possible. Well, the answer was no. It's not possible to do it another way. It also means that there's no other way for anyone to be forgiven besides the cross. There's, there isn't any good works of any kind from any other religious system that can bring that reconciliation to you. It's, it's not Allah and, and Islam. It's, it's none of that. It's Jesus and his cross alone. Why That's did right. God make us when he knew he was going to have to sacrifice his son for us? Because he loved us. Because he loved us. Um, he's glorified through it. Yeah. If you figure it out, let me know. Lance Lindenberg said, because God runs children. Mm -hmm. But boy, are we nasty. Yeah. As the Paul describes us in the Ephesians 3, we're children of wrath. Children of wrath, apart from God. Ephesians 2. I know it's in Ephesians. I, I got it in the book. I'm in the right book. But how much fun it's going to be to praise him in heaven. Oh, yes. gracious, I can't wait. That's right. And so now, since we know what the system of atonement is, that it always cost something and it's been paid, atonement does something. It opens up some doors to some really great things. This is something you need to make sure that you bring up if you have, if you have this conversation with someone where you're talking about these concepts. Since atonement occurs, we have been reconciled to God by the death of Jesus. Reconciliation in and of itself is a beautiful thing. Romans 5.10, we've been reconciled to God by the death of Jesus. The door to a new life and God, or with God in Christ, has been opened to us. Ephesians 1.3, if we can have a reader. Ephesians 1.3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with, in, in, in Christ, in Christ and all, with all spiritual blessings. In heavenly places. <laughs> yep. Very good. Very good. Good job, Randy. <laughs> Blessed us in Christ with what was it? With every all with all spiritual blessings. When that atonement takes place, your sin debt is put away. You're in Christ now. Every spiritual blessing in Christ is now made available to you. We're going to look at a couple of those in more detail in the coming weeks, but that's the door that has now just been swung wide open. For us and for those who believe in Jesus and are baptized into Christ and, and all of that. Um, I wasn't expecting you to just recite that, Randy. It threw me off. And so since we want others to receive all of this for themselves, we want them to know how to be the recipients of this atoning work of Jesus and the blessings that it brings. We need to be prepared with this information. We got to be able to explain it. I'd like to look at one more text before we get into the practical stuff tonight. We've got some time for that. Uh, John three sixteen is probably one you can recite as well. For God so loved the world, gave His only Son. That's right. All right, we know it. John three sixteen. Let's talk about the nature of atonement. The nature of us getting this reconciliation, what is the nature of it? Starts with a G, ends with ift. Gift. It's a gift. God gave. 
God gave his only son, his only begotten son. That's the nature of this atonement. It's a, it's a gift. It's not something you can compel God to give you. He gives it out of his own free will. It's a gift. It's not something that's due. It's not compelled. How is it received? God gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him. That is the way that somebody lays hold of this great gift is through belief. That's the avenue that receiving this gift takes by belief. Having a faith, a real and living faith, biblical faith, is always one that obeys from the heart. It's one that's convinced and says, yes, that's, I'm believing that, I'm going to pursue it, I'm going to live my life in light of that. That's the kind of faith, the belief that we're talking about. And the last thing I want to look at in John 3.16 is the motivation for God providing this gift. For God so loved. Loved the world. That's the motivation behind doing this in the first place. As a demonstration of God's great love to mankind who didn't deserve it. That he gave this atonement as a gift to them that they can be blessed in it and reconciled back to himself, and it's available through true faith in his only son. Isn't that great? It's so simple, it's so straightforward, and I hope that you can reproduce that in your conversations with people. Can, can you believe? I mean, we no, know I can't. That, uh, <laughs> we, we love our, our spouse, we love our children, we love our parents, but our love is nothing compared to God's love. Yeah. It's just something that we can only have a little piece of understanding of. That's right. It's just... Oh. Yeah, our, our love is nothing yeah. nothing like his. And on days when I get down and it's just, oh, you know, mm -hmm. I think of that great love and it just picks me right back up. Yeah. It should. It should pick you back up. It's a beautiful, wonderful thing. So, we have now moved into the practical application portion of our class this evening. We have a volunteer-ish with Mr. Mike over there. Ish. Your, your, Remember, your, your I'm, time first, is, I'm first up Sunday morning. So. Your, your time is coming. So let's recap real quick. We have the lamp illustration that we can use. If you don't feel comfortable with that illustration or if you need to rehear it or if, if you would like it in writing, let me know, and I can get that to you so that you can use it to, to talk about this concept with somebody else. Next, another practical way that you can present this concept to somebody is with using what we'll call the who, who, what, what, what method. Who, who, what, what, what. Five questions with five answers. The first who is, who is God? The second who is, who am I apart from God? Let me know when you're ready for the what. Okay. Who is God and who am I apart from God? The first what, what should God do to us or do to me? Depending on how personal you want to go with it, you, you'll need to kind of measure that as you go. What should God do to us? Second, what is, what did God do for us? And the last, what is, what should be my response to that? And that's where the, the finger thing that we talked about the other week, here, here believe, repent, confess, be baptized, live faithfully, that's where you can plug that in. That's a good opportunity to, to that because that's, that's the response portion of using that method. So who is God? Who am I apart from God? What should God do to us? What did, what did God do for us? And then what should be my response to that? If you can get those five things down, you're golden. 
You'll, you'll have everything that you need to make that presentation and tell them exactly what they need to hear and what to do in response to it. And if everybody's got that, then we're gonna, we're gonna move on to Mr. Fritz, who just looks so enthused over there. He is ready. He is ready. Now, if, if you wouldn't mind coming up here, if that's okay. <laughs> Safety hat and vest. Safety hat and vest. Safety hat and vest. All right. We're going to do. Uh oh. I don't want this. You don't want that either? No. Okay. No, it's on. That's why it was ringing. You have to be able to hear you, sweetheart. I, I'll. Get close. No. <laughs> All right. We're going to do. We, we need to give credit where credit is due. Uh, there's a gentleman who unfortunately is not part of, of the Lord's Church. His name is Ray Comfort. But he uses. He uses a method that I believe is very, very good at getting to the heart of some issues and, and opening people up to this kind of a dialogue. Say his name again. Ray Comfort. There's comfort in Ray. C O M F I R T. Just like a couch. Comfort. Yep. <laughs> comfort couch. Comfort couch. <laughs> Ray Comfort. You can see his stuff on YouTube. Uh, you can see it in action with various people. Be mindful he is. He doesn't preach the fullness of the gospel, but as far as getting the conversation going, it's very good. So thank you for being a volunteer. What? Yeah, a volunteer. So what Ray does is he uses the Ten Commandments as the, the baseline of morality with people. So he'll go to somebody and say, Hi there, my name's Ray Comfort, David Lee. What's your name? Mike Fritz. Mike Fritz. Nice to meet you, Mike. Would, would you be interested in determining if you're a good person? Yes. You want to take the good person test? Well, great. I, I just have a couple of questions for you. Do you believe in God? Yes. You believe in God? That's great. That's a great place to start. Are you familiar with the Ten Commandments? Yes. Okay, so we'll just use those as a baseline to determine if you're a good person or, or maybe not. Are you ready? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> yes. No. He, he can answer however he wants. But... No, All right, so, now tell me, Mike. Have you, ever, have you ever stolen anything in your life, big or small, regardless of value? Yes. You've stolen something. Okay. Um, have, you ever, have you ever used the Lord's name in vain? Used it like a... Well, let's, let's ask this first. You've stolen something. What do you call somebody who steals something? A thief. A thief. Okay, so you're a thief. <laughs> you're a thief. You're a thief. You've broken that commandment. Have you ever uh, have you ever lied before? Yes. All right. So, what do you call somebody who tells lies? David Lee. David Lee. <laughs> <laughs> liar. A liar. All right. So you're a thief and you're a liar. I'm finding no comfort in this. No comfort. <laughs> it's not supposed to be. What your name was Ray Comfort. Ray Comfort. Uh, have you ever used the Lord's name in vain before? You used it like a swear word, carelessly, anything like that? Yes. Yes. Okay. So we have a, well, that's called blasphemy. You know that, right? When, yeah. you, when you use God's name, it's called blasphemy. So I found that out after I did that. After you did it. Well, that's what he told you. So we have lying, and you're a thief, and a blasphemy, a blasphemer, and you can go on. You can go on from there. I'm not going to ask you yet. Have you ever lusted before? you ever killed before? Have you ever done any of these things? Not yet. Not yet. He's about, <laughs> he's about to do that one. All right, so we've just established that you're a lying, thieving, blasphemer. You're, you're an adulterer at heart. You, you're a murderer at heart because of the way that you think towards me right now. <laughs> so if God were to judge you based on these Ten Commandments, would you be guilty or innocent? Guilty. 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 Would you be going to heaven or hell? Through grace. <laughs> see, see what that conversation does, though? Yeah, but wait a minute. Baptism yeah, baptism. thank you. Yeah, we're we're that discussing was before. That's before. Yeah. That's that's true. But we're we're talking to people who are unconverted. I thought it was three after. <laughs> and at least three after. <laughs> we're not asking you. We're not we're not asking you. Well, that's he asked them. He asked them, or do you think you're a good person? Mm -hmm. And so they established in their mind they're a good person. Right. right. They, they think they're a, that they're a good person. They haven't taken into consideration God and his laws. I don't need you anymore. But so, well, thank you. Thank you. I don't need you anymore. You've, you've served your purpose. 
We're, we're going to North Canton. Oh. <laughs> but that's that's how the Ray Comfort method works. If you have YouTube, check it out. He does a better job of doing it than I do. Yes, yes sir. I saw him do that on a public beach in California. Mm -hmm. I thought they're going to stone him. Yes. Be careful <laughs> where you do this. That's, that's I really good. thought they could act with this, this young woman got up and he said, do you think you're a good person? Do you think you would stand up to the Bible with that? And yeah, I think I was. So he went through what you did. Mm -hmm. And so when he got through, he said, so we've established that though we think we're good, unless we receive the grace of God, we're not. Not so much. If anybody would like to talk to me, that girl stepped closer to her. Mm -hmm. She'd just been embarrassed in front of everyone, but she wanted to get rid of that guilt. Right. I was very impressed with the way he did it. Now, it's, a, it's an excellent method. Um, use it in the right context. It's probably best if you know the person you're having that one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, otherwise, like Randy said, they might want to stone you for... Yeah, punch in the face like, like Joe. But what it does is it uses something that you know. The Ten Commandments, it's a moral baseline that they can see, all right, I, I'm objectively not as good as I thought I was. Whether they actually acknowledge that and do anything with that, we'll have to find out. But What if they answer, no, they've never done anything? Then they're a liar. <laughs> <laughs> or, what if these, you do, do you believe in God? No. Nope. Well, you, you'll have to go through a different avenue, but, uh, but hopefully that they acknowledge some kind of, of a deity. Uh, if not, you're going to have to start at a different place. Yeah. But assuming that they are in that place, that's a, a good place to start. Ellie, I saw your hand up. If at the end, like, we were teasing. Uh, say if Michael said, "Yes, I have kept. I have not kept all these commandments, but I still feel like I'm. I can be saved because of." And then he goes ahead and tells his religious mm -hmm. thoughts. Well, you might not be able to address that right now, but at least you've got that in mind. Mm -hmm. So next time you talk to him, you know where he's coming from. Right. Yeah, you, you've established a baseline with that conversation. You had a better idea of where to go from there. Any other comments or questions? All right, I got it. I'm running late. One more point. One more point. All right, so he uses this Ten Commandments as, as a baseline for us to get that conversation going. It puts pressure on the person's conscience. Like Mike, we saw he didn't care for it. He didn't like that. Uh, you'll probably run into that. And then... After you get through that, you make your presentation with the who, who, what, what, what. You're not a good person. You, you stand objectively guilty before God, a holy God. You're, you're not what you should be. What did God do for us? And what do we do in response to it? That's when you make your presentation. Um, we'll leave off the last scripture so we can wrap up this evening. But uh, I appreciate everybody's participation. I enjoyed the class. I hope you did as well. Cheat us out of the scripture. Want a scripture? Okay, we'll do one more scripture. 2 Corinthians 5, 8, 18 through 19. 8 and 18 through 19? No, I, I just stuttered. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 19. Paul says, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. God reconciling the world to himself, not counting sin against sinners. That's the purpose of the atonement. That's the work that's being done. And the last thing we'll leave you with is God reconciling the world to himself through the atoning blood and work of Jesus is the message that we have been entrusted with to share. I hope you're willing to share it. I hope you understand it well enough to share it. And uh, with that, we'll, we'll go ahead and close off with our song. 
Thank you for joining the Dover Church of Christ for our Wednesday night Bible study. We hope the materials presented were beneficial to you. If you have any questions, please reach out to us at doverchurchofchrist.net on our contacts page.